My name is Noah. I'm a developer evangelist. Um, Flux, if any of you caught Paul's talk yesterday, is our data scripting language. Uh, it's uh, going to be a major component of InfluxDB 2.0, um, but it's also going to be available as a standalone binary. Um, it's a functional programming language that's been built for querying, data exploration, uh, and munging. <clears throat> so I think Paul probably covered yesterday a bit about the basics of the language, um, what it's going to be used for. Uh, and today we're going to talk a little bit about some additional features in greater depth. Um, so the features that I'm planning on talking about today uh, are windowing, selectors, and aggregates, uh, grouping of data, joins, and pivots. Um, so windowing helps us break, us break up data by time and apply selectors and aggregates to those various windows. Grouping lets us slice time series data by arbitrary dimensions to do some sort of exploration and analysis on those data. Uh, joins allow us to join data from multiple tables together, uh, which opens the door to math across measurements and some other useful functionality. And finally, pivots, which allow us to reshape our data, uh, either to fit our applications or visualizations or for data exploration or the like. Um, so we'll start a little with windowing, selectors, and aggregates. Um, this is a graph of system load on my Mac last night as I was working on these slides. Um, it's unwindowed currently, uh, but the question is, what if we wanted to break this data up into periods? Uh, so Flux comes with a really simple function called window right there at the bottom. Um, first, we select the data that we want to use. We apply a range to it. And then finally, we window the data and we say how much of a period we want that window to be. So once this function has been applied to the data, uh, the graph looks a little bit like this. So windows actually return individual tables for each windows, uh, which gets graphed by Grafana. Um, if you, you can see the colors maybe a little bit better on those screens. Um, but each one of those buckets is its own table that's been uh, rendered out separately from the others. Um, Windowing is really useful for aligning data. Uh, not every metric has the same timestamp. If you want to do some math across measurements or you know, do computations or compare the, the values uh, most efficiently, aligning the data can be helpful. Um, it'll let you smooth and transform data for analysis when combined with selectors or aggregates. Um, it's really good for working with irregular time series for being able to transfer data that's coming in sporadically into data that is represented periodically. Um, um, so that you can do additional kinds of math and, and op operations on that. Um, and it's also really useful for downsampling of data. Uh, so we find that time series data is generally more valuable at higher resolutions the more recent it is. Uh, and as it ages out, it becomes less and less valuable to have that high resolution data. Um, so using the window function, we could take windows of you know, an hour long period and transform the 15 second metrics in that period uh, into something for, for long term storage to save on space and, and things like that. Oops, sorry. Um, there's an additional function that we can use. It's actually a flux function that's written in flux, um, and it's an extension of the <coughs> Excuse me. It's an extension of the window function. Um, it basically lets you automatically apply some kind of aggregation to the data that you've windowed. Um, so this could be done yourself, uh, just directly in Flux. Uh, but we've written a helper function to make it a little bit easier for you to do it. There's a lot of aggregator functions um, that we've already added to the language. Uh, you can find more details about these in the spec file in the Flux repo, um, as well as in the help documentation online. Um, but they let you do everything from doing counts to covariance and derivatives uh, to taking histogram quantiles, integrals, medians. Um, so a lot of powerful functionality there. We also have some selector functions. Um, these will let you grab individual data points from your, your series. Um, so you can grab the most recent, the highest current, the top, um, the bottom, distinct values, things like that. Uh, and both selectors and aggregators can be applied to individual windows to let you do transformation on that data. Uh, so the most simple example is just applying a mean. Um, so at the top we have the same system load data I showed before, um, but windowed. And then below that, we show the actual aggregate of those windows. Um, so I'm just calculating the mean function here. Uh, and as you can see, the, <coughs> the sort of individual peaks correspond to the, the various mean values of the function. 
Um, so this is a really powerful technique. It's used a lot. Um, it's sort of the building block for a lot of other functions that come later on uh, in the data exploration process. Grouping <clears throat> is the next uh, function I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, this is something that becomes really valuable again in data exploration uh, when looking at you know, issues, triaging problems, uh, being able to group your data in arbitrary dimensions and compare it against each other um, can be really valuable. Uh, so every table that exists in Flux comes back with a group key. Uh, that's a list of columns for which every row has the same value. Um, so for the from functions, the default group key for tables is every column except for time and value. Uh, but you can also specify your own group keys. So this is what a group key looks like. Um, really simple. It has uh, a number of values, the start, the stop, the field values, the measurements, and the host. Um, and if you actually uh, take a look at some functions in practice, um, what that ends up looking like, uh, because the host is in there, um, when the grouping, uh, the default grouping is applied, and every uh, every every uh, column is part of, is part of that group key, um, then you actually get two tables for the data: one for my Docker installation and one for my local Mac. Um, if I wanted to go ahead and change that default group key so that all of that data showed up in the same table, I can do that as well. Uh, that's what I'm showing in the second example there. Um, there is sort of towards the bottom here. There is a function that says group, columns, uh, start, stop, field, and measurement. So basically the same as the default group key, except in this example, I'm excluding the host, and therefore some of the data actually shows up uh, in, in the table. So in the top table under host, there's Docker for Mac in one, and Noah MacBook Pro local in the other, and then <clears throat> in the second uh, group table, um, those host values are all in the same column. There's a number of group use cases uh, for grouping. Uh, like I mentioned just a minute ago, it's extremely useful for drilling down into data, uh, for making comparisons. Um, so if you're looking at IoT sensors or something like that, uh, you might be talking about the overall temperature of a system that you're monitoring versus the temperatures of individual components. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, uh, as with the example I just showed, is that when you're using aggregators, um, you should be explicit about your group keys. Uh, you want to understand what data you want to aggregate, what data you want to group by. Um, if you have different uh, uh, different fields, or sorry, different labels that you want to group over, um, then being aware of your group keys and being conscious of that uh, is is really helpful. Uh, the next function that's uh, pretty valuable in terms of uh, what people want to be able to do with time series data um, are joins. Joins are actually one of the most highly requested features that we get in Influx QL, and so it's exciting to be able to provide that kind of functionality in Flux. Um, right now, the joins uh, support inner, cross, left, right, and full. Um, it defaults to inner. Uh, but it enables a lot of functionality that people have been asking for. Uh, one of those is math across measurements, which David is going to show in a bit more detail later. Um, and then with the addition of other from functions, it gives you the ability to actually add metadata from other sources. So you could potentially pull in something from a relational database that correlates device IDs with more specific metadata about that device, um, and then join those tables together to give you all of that data in the same uh, time series so that you can do legends and other type of interesting stuff. Uh, so the join function takes two arguments. Um, it takes the tables that you'd like to join, um, and right now it only takes two tables, um, as well as, on, as, as the on column. So those are the columns that we want to join on. Um, <clears throat> Columns that need to be renamed due to ambiguity uh, when joins are in process, um, columns that occur in more than one input stream, uh, end up getting renamed according to the template column underscore table. Um, so another thing to, to keep in mind as you're using joins. So here we have two examples of uh, some data. Uh, on the left, we have temperature in San Francisco. On the right, we have temperature in New York. Yep, definitely temperature in New York. Um, and we want to potentially join this data together so that it all shows up in one table. Um, 
The function for that is really simple. We call joins. We provide it with the two tables. The first is SF temperature and the second is New York temperature. And then we provide it a list of columns that we want to join on. In this case, we want to join on time as well as field. Uh, so going back to the previous example, time is going to be the same across both, uh, both of these tables. Um, and so is field, right? They're all temperature fields. This is not a particularly complex example. Uh, so once we've run that join, this is what the output looks like. Um, the time and field columns have been joined together, and the value New York and value SF columns have been generated from the other tables. Um, those are columns that are being renamed because uh, they existed in both places, and there would be some ambiguity after the join has been completed. So let's look at a real world example really quick. Um, this is actually something that we at Influx use to calculate batch size for some of our uh, cloud offerings. Um, the first query at the top gets us data about HTTP requests. Um, it selects from the Telegraph bucket, we give it a range, uh, and then we filter that data down to InfluxDB HTTP requests, specifically write requests, and group it by, uh, and sorry, filter it by cluster ID as well. So we can look at individual clusters out in our system and understand uh, from that query uh, the number of write requests that are coming in. Uh, or sorry, the number of HTTP requests that are coming in. Uh, the second code block there is getting a second table. This is the write table. Um, in this case, we're grabbing data from the InfluxDB write measurement, um, and we're grabbing specifically the field points requested, and again, the cluster ID. Um, we do some aggregates on both of these. We take derivatives because they're monotonically increasing numbers and derivatives make our counters and derivatives make sense there. Um, and then finally what we want to do is actually uh, join those tables. So we're going to join them together. We provide uh, the two tables, HTTPD uh, and write. And then we provide the columns that we want to join on. In this case, the time, the start and stop columns, uh, and the hosts that we want to join. The math across measurements comes in right at the end, and I'll just touch on this really briefly, uh, but there's a map function down there. So once the two, <coughs> excuse me, once the two tables have been joined together, uh, we can actually go ahead and use the map function to do math across the various columns in the table. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and grab the time column and populate a new column, also called time, in a new table. Um, and then we're going to create another column called value and use the map function to actually divide um, the HTTP requests by the number of points written. And so ultimately, this is going to give us a rough understanding of the batch sizes that our customers are using to write data into our cloud environment. Um, that's useful for support. It's useful for troubleshooting. Um, sometimes, you know, batch sizes aren't high enough. They're too high. They're running into issues. Um, so having this kind of query allows us to get that information without having to talk to the customer and have them dig through their configurations and understand what they're doing. Um, so again, math across measurements, asked for a lot. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it in a minute. Uh, the final function that I wanted to talk about is pivot. Um, the pivot function is uh, pretty simple, it's standard. Uh, it collects values stored vertically, column-wise, in the table, uh, and aligns them horizontally, row-wise, into logical sets. Um, so that's really good for reshaping the data into a format suited for your application. Um, it can be used in combination with other functions to create summary tables and things like that. Uh, but ultimately, this can also be really useful just for human beings. <coughs> Sometimes when we're looking at data in one format or one shape, uh, it just makes less sense to us than if we're looking at it in another format or another shape. Uh, so having the ability to go through and actually change uh, the shape of the data can be beneficial both to ourselves and to the applications that we write. Um, so the pivot function takes three parameters. Uh, it takes a row key, a column key, and a volume column. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what those are. The row key is the list of columns which uniquely identify a row output. Um, so each unique combination of those row keys um, becomes its own row. Uh, the column key is the list of columns used to pivot values onto each row identified by the row key. So each value in the each value in the column key um, actually becomes a unique column itself. Uh, and again, I'll show an example that makes this a little bit more clear. Um, finally, the value column is uh, the 
parameter that identifies a single column uh, that contains the value to be moved around the pivot. Um, so these are the this is the data that actually gets translated from the row into the column or format or vice versa. Uh, so this is an example just of some very simple sample data. Uh, we've got timestamps, we've got values, we've got a field called underscore measurement, um, which is all uh, measurement M1. And then we have underscore fields, which vary from F1, F2, F3, null, um, and, and that's it. Um, so what we want to do in this use case is instead of presenting the data uh, vertically, where say F1, F2, and F3 are all in a horizontal arrangement, or in a vertical arrangement, what we want to do is we want to apply a pivot so that those individual fields uh, get, a, get transformed into their own columns. So this is what the code looks like for that. Um, we're grabbing data from the test bucket, we're giving it a range, and then we're applying at the end the pivot function. Uh, so the pivot function takes the row key, which is time, it takes a column key, which in this case is field, and finally it takes a value column, which is a single column um, called value. So the first two are lists, they can be multiple columns, and the third one is a single column. Um, so what that gives us is we go from this format where everything is organized uh, vertically to this format where things become organized horizontally. Um, this is actually a much easier way for human beings to look at the data, especially if they want to be able to correlate these various values and understand how they relate to each other. Um, it can also be used in conjunction with other functionality to build summary tables for your dashboards and things like that um, that give you an overview of the system as a whole. Um, the pivot function is actually one that was a little bit confusing for me to understand at first, uh, but fortunately, my coworker Sonia has a wonderful blog about the pivot function um, that I highly recommend you go check out. Um, the link is there. I'm sure the slides will be available. Um, but if you want to read a little bit more about Pivot and see some applications and different ways to use it, uh, then you can go, ha go ahead and check out that function. So that's it. Uh, that's all I have for now. Uh, we do have a community site. Um, on there, there are categories for both InfluxDB 2.0 as well as Flux. Uh, so if you are starting to play around with either the language or the platform and you have questions and you want to talk to people, uh, please hop over to community.influxdata.com and ask away. Uh, myself, the other DevRel teams, a lot of the engineers, Paul every now and then, uh, will check into that uh, site and, and answer your questions for you. Um, so yeah, that's it. If you have any feedback, uh, there's my Twitter and my GitHub as well as my email. Uh, feel free to, to reach out to me and ask any questions. Thanks.